to be doing a talk on uh, highlighting the synergy between the nutritional ketosis and the endocannabinoid system and how to um, combine these technologies of phytocannabinoids from cannabis plants with a ketogenic diet. So that one will be really cool. Uh, if any of you guys are health nuts, um, then that should be quite a treat. Uh, so tonight, um, we, oh, I do have to say technically, um, this is a safe space for us to come together and speak freely about these substances. And so I ask that in order to protect that, that you don't uh, talk about buying, selling, or distributing any illegal substances at these events. Please don't come on any illegal substances to the events because it can jeopardize uh, the ability for us to even have these events because we just never know if there's going to be an undercover or somebody that wants to ruin all our fun. Um, so yes, today we have a special guest, Matteo Palomari, and he's been studying plant shamanism uh, for about 30 years, and he's going to be doing a talk uh, titled Mestizo and Ayahuasca Shamanism in the Peruvian Amazon, and I'll just read his bio real quick so you can get a sense of him. So Matt goes by Mateo as well. Palomari is an award-winning writer, musician, and sound healer who has been studying shamanism all of his life and incorporates shamanic practices into his daily life as well as into his writing and teaching. His historical novel of first contact between shamans and just Jesuits. Jesuits. <laughs> Jesuits. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> in 18th century. South America, titled Land Without Evil, received rave reviews along with a San Diego Book Award. It was also adapted into a stage show, the making of which was the subject of a PBS series that garnered an Emmy nomination. Matt has spent 30 years studying ayahuasca, its rituals and traditions, and its helper plants, and has done extended shamanic plant dietas in the Peruvian Amazon for the last 20 years. He has also studied and worked with numerous other visionary and healing plants found worldwide. His memoir, Spirit Matters, detailing his journeys to Peru, working with shamanic plant medicines, took place took first place in the San Diego Book Awards Spiritual Book category and was an award-winning finalist in the autobiography slash memoir category of the National Best Book Award. Spirit Matters is also available as an audiobook. His book on writing, Fantastic Fiction, A Shamanic Approach to Story, took first place in the International Book Awards Writing and Editing category, and his popular Fantastic Fiction workshop has been a staple of the Santa Barbara Writers Conference and the Southern California Writers Conference for over 25 years. Aside from lecturing at numerous venues throughout the United States and appearing on numerous radio shows, podcasts, and television shows, Matt has spent extended time in the jungles, mountains, and deserts of North, Central, and South America, pursuing his studies of shamanism, shamanism sorry, and ancient cultures. So, <coughs> I present to you, Mateo Palomari. Whoop, whoop. Thank you. I, I get tired of hearing my bio. Oops. Oh, sorry. First off, I really appreciate everybody coming. Glad a few more filled in. I, I, I got eclipsed by the eclipse, but that's nothing new to me. Um, some years ago, I was at a science fiction convention speaking, and they scheduled me opposite of Buzz Aldrin. So not only did I not get to see Buzz, but I had to basically sit by myself and twiddle my thumbs. So it's just the way the universe works. But we are being uh, broadcast on Facebook, and uh, thank you everybody out there for checking in, especially my East Coast homies. So, um, this talk is a run-up. I'm going to be doing a uh, month-long tour in Florida next month. And um, it's part of an exhibit. Has anybody heard of Pablo Amaringo? <laughs> Famous, top-notch, ayahuasca painter. So it's going to be an exhibit of um, 95 of his paintings. 
I'm going to be lecturing on shamanism, very similar to this. And then I'm going to be performing with uh, Tito La Rosa, who's an Emmy-winning pre-Columbian instrument specialist from Peru. And these guys I've been uh, singing and playing with in the jungle for all these years are coming up also. So I'm going to get to play and sing. I'm a drummer and a vocalist. And uh, in sessions, I sing the Icaros and all that. I am curious, uh, how many people have done ayahuasca? OK, good. Uh, how many of you, if any, I know, I'm pretty sure you have, Caitlin, uh, been to the jungle or some place of that nature? OK, oh, I like this. OK, you guys are all hardcore, my peeps. <laughs> so um, I'm going to go through the slideshow a little bit. I'll talk a little bit about how I got into all of this. And then I'll have time afterwards for some questions and answers. And uh, as a little aside, I have a long history of uh, altered state experience. goes back many years, um, maybe 72. I started off hyperventilating, and then I was sniffing glue, and then <laughs> weed came along, but then, of course, an LSD came along, and that was it, all sorts. But I have a lot of experience, and I did a lot of uh, experimental things over the years. Um, but throughout of all of it, ayahuasca has been the top me, the best plant teacher, um, just taught for, um, I think, all the right reasons. So a little bit about shamanism. Um, shamans were the first storytellers. They were the first healers, performing artists, uh, bards, doctors, psychologists, all of those things. And um, when I speak to more conservative type groups, I like to, I like to throw them off in the beginning and tell them, thank you for inviting me to come here and speak about the world's oldest profession. And I always let that hang for a little bit until they get squirmy, and then I go, yeah, I know where your minds are going, and then I got hooked. <laughs> I didn't feel like I had to do that here because you guys are already kind of on board. But um, I'll get into a few little basics too, uh, because it's a kind of a mixture of people here. But um, ayahuasca, uh, the brew is called ayahuasca. But it's a mixture of two plants. One is the ayahuasca vine, which is Bama stereopsis copy. And the other one is uh, chacruna, they call it in Peru, uh, which is Psychotria viridis, which is more of a bush. And it's a mixture of the two plants. And I'm going to show you here in just a minute with some slides on how it goes together. It makes the equivalent of uh, crank or, crankcase oil with battery acid. And it's probably a good uh, <laughs> reference to it. <laughs> But I want to say just a little bit. So um, I've always been fascinated with altered states. I've always been fascinated with shamanism. So I was doing some research um, in the UCSD library some years ago. I wrote this novel, I Had the Predator, is about a guy who learns how to get into uh, you know, bodies of animals. And I was got fascinated with lycanthropy, which is the werewolf mythology. And lycanthropy goes back to shapeshifting. And I realized that shape-shifting and visionary plants in South America were like, whoo. Shape-shifting is a worldwide phenomenon, but especially done in South America. So I started researching, and, and uh, back then, back in the olden days, I used to log on to the UCSD computer with my dial-up. i print out pages and pages of stuff. And then um, I'd take the print-outs and I'd go to the library, and I'd spend 30 bucks on a copy card, and I'd copy everything. So I learned a lot about the plants. Well, um, soon after that, I was walking through Pacific Beach here, and I saw a head shop, and I went, oh, that's interesting. I haven't been to a head shop for years. So I walked in, and to my surprise, there was High Times Magazine. And I'm like, wow, I haven't seen that thing since the 70s. Is that still around? And I picked it up, and I flipped it open, and right there, right where I flipped it, right where I looked, was an ad for an entheobotany seminar. And all the people that I had been researching on my own individually at the UCSD library were presenting. So I really didn't have any money, but I really didn't give a shit because I got out my credit card and I'm like, I want to go on there. So I went to the first one in San Francisco in 96. Uh, if anybody knows anybody, Sasha Shulgin was there, and Terrence McKenna, and Christian Reich, and all these people. And I found out that they were going to entheobotany seminars in Mexico. They were originally the, the uh, Palenque Entheobotany Seminars, and the first one I went to was Ushmal uh, in 98. And that's where I met Terrence McKenna, and uh, Jonathan Ott, and Chris Chandraish, and all these guys, Sasha Shogun, and 
so I should show that. Um, and I found the tribe. So through that and through the research I was doing, um, I found out someone who was going into the jungle and doing ayahuasca and doing the dietas. And I was so adamant that I wanted to do it that they kept blowing me off for a while. And then they figured out I wasn't going to go away. And they figured out I was serious about what I was doing. And um, it wasn't about, gee, I'm going to go to the jungle, or people would say to me, gee, you're brave, you're going to go to the jungle. It was none of that. I had to go, period. So uh, as a result of that, and, and part of that, uh, this is a historical novel, Land Without Evil. And um, I got the story, it's, it's from uh, an honors course in anthropology that I took, and I talked about all this stuff that I was fascinated with. So this is the first contact with the Jesuits um, in the rainforest, but it's told from an Indian's point of view. It's really deep into shamanism. Um, and so it got tied in with this one. I purposely wrote this, this was published in 99, and I wrote it, it's visionary experience to a high degree, but there are no plants and no substances. So I got high schoolers to read it, and I got it into a few schools. So I was like kind of, Deviant undercover even back then, you know. Now I'm getting more out about it. And then after all that, she mentioned Spirit Matters, which this is my memoir. Uh, I figured out that my life wasn't quite normal. I mean, whose life is? But this ends in the jungle with my first ayahuasca dieta. But I, I do want to get into some nitty gritty here um, of uh, where I've been. I, I spent a lot of time with the Shipibo Indians. Um, if anybody heard of Michael Harner's book, uh, The Way of the Shaman, he originally, he was one of the first Westerners to contact the Shipibo. They're, they're the Shipibo Kanibo, but now they're really going by Shipibo because um, things are getting mixed up, sometimes in not so good ways. But um, the Shipibos are, are more or less sort of one of the primary known keepers of uh, ayahuasca traditions, but there's tons of them down there. So I want to touch on a few. I've worked in four different traditions, but one of the things I've discovered is the tradition that I've been working in the longest is actually the most pure. And it's, it's mestizo guys. But um, I spent some time with one of their mentors some years ago, and I'll never forget as long as I live, he said to me, I am a plant man. My father was a plant man. His father was a plant man before him, and his father was a plant man. I mean, he started reciting his generation. They were all plant men. So it didn't matter if he was Spanish or Mexican or part Chinese or black or all the different races that have been getting integrated into Peru. He carried that tradition and it's been the most pure tradition. So I thought I would show a little bit of the two traditions and touch on, on, on some other things. And then um, we'll go ahead. So you can go ahead the first one. Thank you, Kate. Kate. Oh, how did that get up there? Can oh we skip it? Um, I just want to say, uh, shamanism is about transformation. This book has to do with writing and transformation. And it's a phoenix, and I confess that's an American Indian who's dancing in front of it. But I wanted to get the essence of transformation, because it's the essence of what story is. And um, if, has anybody heard of the hero's journey? Joseph Campbell, Hero of a Thousand Faces? Okay. The real roots of the hero's journey uh, comes from the sh shaman's journey to the underworld. Um, in, a, in a very concise way, um, they travel to the underworld. In South America, they get swallowed by the jaguar. In other cultures, they get dismembered. Um, they get their bones replaced with quartz and other things. Down there, they call it being swallowed by the jaguar. Uh, and in essence, what it is, is being swallowed up by your shadow. Because in the end, it's shadow work. And shadow work is the most terrifying of all because it's all the stuff that we don't Anyway, okay. So I, I mentioned this earlier. They were the first medical specialists in indigenous communities, and their traditional methods are known to be effective in treating both physical and psychological ailments. The chemical components of plants that shamans use in healing rites could conceivably be building blocks for new drugs or cures for such scourges as cancer or AIDS. For thousands of years, indigenous groups have made extensive use of the materials contained in the rainforest to meet their health needs. The World Health Organization estimates that 80% of the people in developing countries still rely on traditional medicine for their primary health care needs. Without money, access, or faith in modern facilities, indigenous people depend on shamans, herbal healers, and rainforest plants for their survival. Shamans also play a crucial role in helping scientists to discover the potentials of plants. As 
Because one time scientist has said, every time a medicine man dies, it is as if a library has burned down. I just want to add a couple of things. We're all seeing now how much finally cannabis is getting out there, is, and, and the, all the CBD stuff and the precise things that they're doing is finally getting out there. And I think that this, and part of this medicine, is kind of part of the revolution and transition and change. So, um, one of the things that's really important is that you can work with different plants in the jungle, but if you're not working with them in context, it's not going to have the same effect. Like when you do the plant dieta, you're in a tropical environment, you're sweating your ass off, you're eating in a particular way, you're taking in particular plants in a particular way, and so you can get amazing results in that context. But a lot of pharmaceutical corporations go down and they're trying to isolate like one component, and it's not that. It's all of it together. And that is also a shamanic view where, where we are integrated in nature. And that's what happens when you get down there. You become the jungle. And I got little stories about that, but we'll see how much time we have for that. Well, let's move on. So this is a Shabibo shaman, uh, David. I worked with him a lot. And then I found out over time that he was not a person of integrity, particularly with the women. So he's, he's dressed, he's, he's, you know, he's got the headdress, he's got the kushma. You can see the designs there um, are all over the Shipibo pattern work. They're representative of songs and, and energy. But um, I worked with him for a while and then I found out what he was doing. And I'm, I'm not going to get into the details. There were other things he didn't do. But the point is this. There's so much of this stuff going on right now that some of it is a bit out of control. And there's a lot of sharks in the water. And this medicine is not something to be messed with. It's not to be taken lightly. It has to be treated with the ultimate, utmost respect. I did a radio show a while back, and um, one of the hosts was talking to me in, on, the, on the air. And he says, oh yeah, well, you know, I made some ayahuasca, and I gave it to my friends. And they went off and they did it, and they had a bad experience. And I'm like, what? You nuts. And I, and I had to kind of hold back. I didn't want to like spank him too much. But I said, in my opinion, you should only do it with somebody who's watching over you. It should only be done in a ceremony. It should be done with someone who really knows what they're doing, who has integrity. When I first found the, um, the people that I worked with the most, and Jared knows who worked with most of them actually, um, it was from somebody I knew who had been working with them for 15 years. And like I mentioned, the fact that he kept blowing me away and he wouldn't let me go in the beginning and kept trying to get rid of me, to me that was actually a good sign. Because he's being very careful. Because after all these years of working with it now, I've seen some of the strangest things you can imagine. And um, I went for five or six years where I was co-leading ceremonies, and sometimes I still co-lead now. Um, it's, if you don't have someone you can really trust, and someone you can be safe with and vulnerable with, it's going to create a safe container so you can lose your mind, which is kind of part of it. You have to sort of lose your mind to find your mind, or whatever is in there, or find yourself, or the thousand selves that we all are, cast the thousands, right? Um, there are all these different things, and there's neurochemical reactions, and there's just other weird energetic woo things that happen. And if you don't have somebody who knows what they're doing, you can really get in trouble. You ever hear once in a while they make a big deal out of it, you know, somebody died in an ayahuasca session. Well, if things aren't watched close enough, and people get too loose around the edges, those things happen. Um, I've been in other circles with people. I did, a, I did a lot of work starting 20 years ago with 5-MEO, which is, seems like it's a big deal now. And I was, um, I've, it's kind of like McDonald's. Hundreds and hundreds served. In fact, at the Planky and the Obanya seminars, I was going around just lighting people off. But I was always very conscious and I was holding the space and I watched every little thing, every little eye twitch, every little breathing, everything. I totally, totally had them energetically covered and protected. Well, some other people I was working with weren't so careful. And I didn't like they were getting too loose around the edges. And I decided I'm done with them. And I got away from them. And I almost had to get physical with them to get them away from me. I'm like, I'm done with you guys. You're not, you're not having any integrity, respect. And so I, I got away. Two months later, somebody died. They were doing this whole thing in a jacuzzi and they thought it was cool. And so my instincts were right when I got away. And those are the things that can happen with almost anything. So, again, this isn't something to be taken lightly. It's not something to be messed with. These are very powerful energies and forces and plants. And they're just not to be taken lightly. That's 
one of the things I really love about this AWARE project. AWARE. This work is all about becoming more aware. And I'm always, always cautionary to people when I'm talking about this stuff. And I think I can consider myself an authority now after 30 years and, and, and 20 years of direct. As I like to say, I did some really good field work. Um, you know, and there was a period where I was studying in all these different traditions, traditions and I did the math and I figured it out that um, there was two or three year stretch there where I was doing it 30 times a year, plus other plants and other substances. I was rocking and rolling. But it's not for everybody, and um, anybody who knows me knows I happen to have a particular kamikaze bent. I'm like, always mega dose first, and then maybe five years later, oh, there's such a thing as a low dose? <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a revelation. So this is um, uh, some of the vine uh, that's getting harvested and chopped up. Uh, unfortunately, with all this ayahuasca tourism, they're starting to have to cultivate more, and a lot of the original stuff is really getting eaten up quickly, which bothers me for different reasons. Next. This is uh, Enrique. This is a Shipibo family that I worked with, and um, I spent maybe a total of six weeks with them. And, um, at the peak of it, I almost died. Um, I got I got really sick in delirious. And I went to Kaiser and they took all these tests and said, we can't find anything wrong with you. And um, I went to an acupuncturist. I'll never forget as long as I live the look on her face. That scared me more than anything. And she said that my liver was shutting down, my heart was at 20%, my lungs, and I was like, totally, I was called sweaty and I could barely dial the phone. Um, and when she, and I've had a fair amount of acupuncture and I gotta tell you, but when she put those needles in, that shit really hurt. Like like poking a bruise. And as it turned out, another woman had the same thing I had. She was a nurse. She got put into a hospital. She went into a coma and she died. Now the uh, unfortunate thing about how this happened is I was in the in the village with them. And they had like Ten different people preparing the food, and I'm sitting there, and uh, a snot nose running kid with chicken diapers goes running by, and then two seconds later, a pig goes running by, and then a chicken, and then a mangy dog, and it really wasn't a good environment. And the acupuncturist said I had uh, a virus and a bacteria, and she literally saved my life. She hit me hard with some stuff, and I had to get a lot of treatments and all that. But the point is, it's the whole thing about, oh, the jungle, and I want to go live with the Indians and all that, and it's not always what it's cracked up to be. So things got a little loose around the edges there. But I still learned a lot. Okay, next. Yeah, um, he, so he gets the vines, and he shaves off the bark, and he cuts it into smaller pieces and shaves it off, but you can see getting down on the bark is a little blurry. Okay, now, he takes the pot like that. Those are the chacruno leaves, which is the uh, psychotria viridis. They contain the DMT. Now you can eat those leaves all day, straight up, and you won't get high because the uh, monoamine oxidase enzyme in your digestive system will digest it before it can become psychologically active, before it can pass the blood-brain barrier. So when you um, mix it with the ayahuasca vine, it has a, a beta carbolines that act as an MAO inhibitor that allows the uh, DMT to become orally active. Now, I told you I had 10 years of experience with 5-MeO-DMT, and I did a lot of NN-DMT. But for me, NN-DMT is just like a sound bite for ayahuasca. You know, <laughs> you know kind of like that. Um, when you're in a good ayahuasca journey, as you guys know who have done it, you can be five, six hours, and you can really be out to lunch. And it can be an ordeal. Often it is. And that's often when some of the best work is being done. Okay, next so he sits there all day with it, and he, he put a big banana leaf over it. And as you'll see, the leaves are layered with the, uh, the cut up pieces of vine. And he sings over it, and he, and he stays with it all day. You see it starting to boil down here. Right? Yeah. All of that, right? You saw the big pile of leaves, and that's a, that's a big ass pot. It was about like that, like that. And, and that's what you end up with right there. So that's your ticket to uh, other places. Next. Yeah, and then just after he took it out, that's all the stuff that's been boiled and he set it aside. Okay, next. Yeah, and that's what the vine looks like after it's been boiled. 
And there I am. So that's Enrique and that's Erlinda. She passed away a few years ago. And uh, David over there, Mr. Suspicious Looking, um, is their son in law. So they were kind of stuck with him. Yeah, that's uh, Manuela. That's, uh, I think she's still alive. And that's uh, Erlinda's mom. She's a cracker. You can't see it very good, but her and Erlinda both uh, have really black hair. And uh, it's a Shipibo tradition, which you'll see in a minute. All right, next. Yeah, there she is. So she has a traditional Shipibo outfit. She has the dress, which is a wraparound. And you can see it has all the colors and patterns that are songs. I don't know how they do it, but I've had them sit there and just sit down there. And they know it's like notes or whatever they do it. I, have, I can't follow it. You know, I'm a musician. But that's what they do. They're representative of songs. And uh, they can be songs to different things. Next. So that, that is done with Wito. And uh, I'm not going to read it. You guys, I'll read it now. I'll read it. Wito is cultivated for stick skinned edible fruit, which when ripe is made into drinks, jelly, and sherbet used in ice cream. Cooking the fruit with brown sugar and aguardiente, which is a liqueur, like kind of a cheap liqueur, uh, makes a very palatable dessert. Guido is rich in mannitol, genepin, tannins, and caffeine. The tannins give the juice an astringent effect. The juice of the immature fruit is clear, but it contains an aerioid of genepin, which oxidizes to a very dark blue color, which is what you see in their hair. This juice is used to decorate clothes and pottery as well as human skin. For example, the Shipibo use crushed widow fruits to put their traditional designs on natural cotton. You saw some of that on his uh, kushma. Either undyed or dyed in mahogany bark, which gives the cloth a distinctive brown color. Using a pointed piece of chanta palm or an iron nail, the paint turns dark blue or black as it is opposed to air. Once skin has been dyed with widow, the color remains for about two weeks. Indeed, a number of companies have begun offering Yagua tattoo paint as an alternative to henna for a semi-permanent tattoo. Okay. That's the flower, that's the fruit. I've eaten it, it's pretty tasty. So I was doing, a, as part of being down there, they were giving us tattoos with the Wito. This is not me, this is one of my buddies, but I wanted to give you just a little example of what they did. Next. This was me. They knew I was a writer. So they said, give me your wrists. And they did that design for me. And they did it, we had a nice party, they did a dance for us, back and forth, a traditional dance. Again, you can see um, these are wraparound skirts and like pieces of cloth. And I have a ton of them. And um, I was lucky, my mom was a seamstress, and before she died, she came out to visit. And I asked her if she would make me a bedspread. And she ran out and went to the sewing machine, and I got this badass bedspread of all that. So aside from the fact that it's really cool looking with all the designs, I'm sleeping under all those songs. So, uh, very cool. Yeah, these are the kids. You can see they got treats because they did a really good dance. And they were yeah. having a good time. That was a celebration. It's like I said, I spent maybe three weeks with them outside of Iquitos and maybe three weeks, a month and a half with them in their village. Um, it kind of became part of the family, for better or worse. Okay, next. So then we went up outside of Iquitos, and this is a, a Bora tribesman. Uh, we didn't drink any ayahuasca with them, but they're also an ayahuasca tribe. So they did a, we spent the day with them, we did a dance, and they had some really cool jewelry and headdresses and stuff like that. Okay. And that was their dance. And you can see here, they did a similar thing with the Wito. This is like cotton. And uh, they do their patterns on there, which you can see they're a little different from the uh, Shipibo patterns. Okay. I just love this picture. I'm sorry. If you guys have been on the internet, I just love this picture. They took us to a zoo. And they told me that was a jaguar, but I found out later from somebody who knew. It's actually an awesome lot. But I just love that picture, so I want to put it up there. Next. And then um, we were doing ceremony and staying. It was right at two tributaries of the Amazon, major tributaries outside of Iquitos. So we were having a blast that day, so I had to get the sunset. Yeah. So now, this is the intro to Rinquilla, this other place I go to, where I've been working with, even though they're mestizo, to me, a much more pure tradition. When they have somebody um, prepare the food, it's only one person. Only one person touches the food. It's very cleanliness, clean. clean. The Shipibo diet was all kinds of different things. On this dieta, you get either um, oatmeal or rice or quinoa.
quinoa boiled. They baked or boiled plantano, which is a banana, which isn't ripe, which tastes just like cardboard. And maybe once or twice, maybe once a day, sometimes twice, but mostly once a day, either chicken or fish. That's it. No soap, no shampoo, no sense of any kind, no salt, no, no that's it. That's all you get. And um, it's a cleansing diet. And in the jungle, they call ayahuasca la purga, which is the purge. And I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, it comes out both ends and every orifice in ways you can't even know. And I can tell you some of those stories, but I'm not going to go there. It really clears you up. Now, typically when you start out, you, it's a 10-day dieta like that. And you do ayahuasca roughly every other night in a ceremony with a shaman. And um, you do that roughly five times over a 10-day period. You also drink a pitcher of uh, a plant or plants every single day, along with this dieta. And then as you move along, they give you more plants. And then as you go further along, like me, I've been there for a long time. The last time I went to the shaman, I said, you know, I've been coming here a long time. And so what they do with the um, people who have more experience is um, you get the five sessions, and then you get two to three by yourself during the day, as much as you want. And, then, and so you're mostly alone, except for when you do the ceremonies. And if you get totally wigged out and freaked out and scream, they'll come. But you're mostly by yourself. So um, this last time I was down there, I said to the shaman, you know, I've been doing all these plants and all this stuff. And, you know, I think maybe it might take a little easy this year. And he looks at me and he goes, we're going to hit you hard. <laughs> I was like, oh, God. Okay? Because I always do everything he says. So I got a big, big mixture of all these different plants, and I did seven sessions over the period of time. And these particular ones were very energizing. And um, I, uh, I, I think I slept two hours every night. That was it. I wasn't tired. I was like, mm. So what happens over time is that um, you get physically weaker, and the boundaries between your conscious and your subconscious start to really blur. And then your dreams and your visions and your waking, they all just start to blur together. And um, your stuff comes up. And you're mostly by yourself, so you can't blame anybody. You can't project on anybody. you got to own it. And it's not always fun. And oftentimes there are physical expulsions related to clearing out whatever may happen, come up, and all that stuff. But you also spend um, all that time you're, you're just eating the dieta and you're taking these plants and you're also taking plant baths. So over time, you begin to smell like the jungle. So as a, a very quick aside, um, traditionally way back in time, they would do this diet and it's why they would say you're not supposed to have sex and other things because over time you lose your human smells and you smell like the jungle. And if you're going to go hunt a jaguar who has a, a, a keen sense of smell and relies on it, you smell like the jungle you sort of become invisible. Not only that, but if you're in a visionary state and you, you can hunt the jaguar in spirit and it's kind of an agreed upon thing and you join your spirit with it and you have this agreement of mutual respect. So you kind of hunt them in your visions first, this is traditionally, and then afterwards you go on the real hunt and follow up and find them, but it's like sort of a mutual agreement. And as you know in, in indigenous cultures, when they kill an animal, it's with the utmost respect, with the understanding that someday, someday you're going to be lunch. So it's that kind of respect. Okay, next. So I know this, yeah, that's okay. So this guy, that frog there, when I came in the last year, he was there waiting for me, and he was a badass. So, and he was like, that. So that's a big meal right there. That's Boca Chica and rice and the Pantano. That, like, if you get that, it's like Thanksgiving. And that fish has really tiny bones. So it's an exercise in patience. Um, and if you're getting buzzed by wasps or other things, then it's really a challenge. So it takes a long time, but you savor it. Okay. So this was one of the really strong ones. You picture every day. This one was Chuchuasi Kumaseva Kalawaska. Energizing and clarity and really fortification. And it hits you really hard because you're getting your body into a chemically pure state. And this uh, dieta over the time makes you extremely alkaline. 
So anybody who's done any research in physiology knows that the heart of inflammation and disease and stuff is acidity. Stress uh, and diet in uh, modern life produces acidity. So this diet is made to uh, make you um, alkaline. And you get cleared out on psychological and spiritual and all these other levels. And the, the more you take the abuse, the more clear you become. And you get very centered. Okay. So this is one of my favorite places in the whole world. That's my tombo I'm looking up from the river. I got bummed on it and put a metal roof on it because I always like to, I really like to go native. But um, that's the last one. Yeah, you can just keep going. It's the last one at the end of the line. There's nobody on the other side of me. I defend it very strongly. It's all open air. Uh, you can see the mosquito net over there to sleep under at night. And that is my favorite spaceship. That's where we do the ceremonies. That's a Maloka. I was there the very first year they built it, and it was actually on the uh, turf ground before they got it raised up off the ground. And at the end of um, 2015, I did my 60th session there. Before I turned 60 years old, whatever that means. So I got a lot of good uh, adventures and memories there, as well as bats that shit on you and tarantulas and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, you can just keep going. So that's a shaman's altar. Um, you can see there's mapachos, the uh, uh, nicotina rustica that grows in the jungle there. This pan pipe right here was made by Tito La Rosa, and it's all condor quills. And it's perfect. I have one. I can't play it, but I got it. <laughs> it's cool. And then you see those rattles, and you have to have a little patron saint there. These are Shipibo rattles with designs there. And this is, you know, Agua de Florida and Chicapa and uh, the, the different things um, that he uses. Okay. I'm just taking different angles from it. That's on the way back. Now, being the last tombo at the end of the whole river, I got to tell you, man, after getting blasted with ayahuasca and all that, all night, and you're coming home like, you know, three or four in the morning, and you're like this, and you got your head lamp on like this, and all of a sudden the monster dive bombing you and all that. It's really an adventure. So that, for me, is always a very welcome sight. Yeah, go up the hill, down the hill. Yeah. Home sweet home. The front veranda. It's going down to the river. The river can rise up. 10 feet an hour or two sometimes if the rain really gets going. So this one is, this is why you saw. And the, the closest thing I can um, relate it to is eucalyptus. But it's not like that. It has its own sweet smell. And by the way, they now have it at Costco. There's a Wayusa tea. And it's very good. It has some caffeine in it. And, it, and it's a very good stimulant. It's become a really, for me, a powerful ally of mine. So every morning you get that bucket and you crush up the leaves and you put the water in it and then during the day you do the plant baths. So you're getting cleansed also from the outside. And I always save a bucket so when I come home at 4 o'clock in the morning and I'm really stinking from sweating and all of whatever other bodily projections I might have on myself for the first thing I get there and take off all my clothes and psh, add it. Anyway, it's a very, very wonderful plant. This is ajo sacha that they also use, but this it's called jungle garlic, and it smells just like garlic. Do you have a question? Yeah, you mentioned the plant bath. What is that? Well, you basically, you fill up the bucket with water and you crush up the leaves in it. So when you're doing this diet, what you're eating is passing things through your body very quickly. And then you're drinking the ayahuasca, and you're taking any number of combination of plants depending. And that's all going through your system. So you're getting cleansed from the inside out, and of course your toxins come out through your pores. So all, not only the toxins and things that are physiologically coming out, but even energetically, you keep washing yourself outside. So you inside, outside, you're, everything's getting cleaned by a plant with a different quality. So that's the sweetest, that's like, the sweetest you got, that's jungle cologne. And of course if it's garlic, well, you know, everybody else is doing it too. But Wayus is my favorite. Okay, next. Okay, that's a good grandpa ayahuasca vine there. You see he has his hand on it. Next. And those are the leaves on it. Okay, this is Shakruna, uh, which is, so there's the ayahuasca vine, and the Shakruna is um, a bush, and it's leafy. 
And so this is virotes. This is how you can tell it's shakruna. I don't know if you guys can see very well from there or not, but they're, virote means dark. So you can see the underside, and that's one of the ways they identify it. And then another thing that really blows me away down there is there's a gazillion plants, and they all kind of all look the same, but they know which plant is which for different qualities and reasons. So um, that's the yeah. There's an underside of one. This is really good. You can probably see them a little better there. Okay, and then. This plant is amazing. They'll take that leaf and they'll cut it in half and they'll just put it in the ground and boosh, roots come out and boom. So they're very pro prolific like that. Okay, next. And that's just a little plot they're starting to farm there. Okay, so this is Ohe. It's a white latex resin and it's used as an anti-parasitic. They'll mix it up sometimes with just a few drops of water and it helps to get rid of parasites and things of that nature. This is one of my favorite plants of all. This is Sangre de Grado, Dragon's Blood. Now, it should be, in Spanish, it should be Sangre, I'm sorry, Sangre de Grado, Sangre, I can't even do it now. <laughs> sangre de Drago. Drago. Yeah, Dragon's Blood. But the Indians mixed it up and they started calling it Sangre de Grado. So that's like the jungle name for it. This is an awesome plant. You can see that it's got chops on it because if you go up and you hit it with a machete, it literally bleeds red. And you take that and it's latex and it's antibacterial. So if you have a cut, you just put it on there and it dries into an instant band-aid. It's also used um, for uh, mix it with water and it's used for ulcers. Uh, if women happen to be having really bad menstrual problems or something like that, uh, hemorrhaging after bleeding, they use it for that. It's really good. And um, I've had cut a few pretty good cuts and I feel like I'm Jungle Boy one up there, oh yeah, I'm going to heal myself, you know, and cut it, put it on there. It's really good stuff. I found out from a friend that, uh, yeah, that's just going up like that. I found out from a friend that something like 70% of what they sell on the market is not the real thing. Mm -hmm. But that's the real deal. So that's just the tree going up. Okay, this is another special tree. It's Tawari. And uh, the bark is used as an anti-inflammatory and anti-tumor treatment and a sexual stimulant. There's lots of that kind of stuff down there. And uh, there's a whole song around this tree because it sustains a lot of different life and it's very much revered. So there's a whole song behind all that tree that celebrates it. And it obviously goes up. Okay, so you guys probably heard of this one, Cunha de Gato, Cat's Claw. And uh, you use the bark, it's anti-inflammatory, tumors, cancer treatment, arthritis, rheumatism, and immune system booster. It's a really powerful plant. You can buy it in a lot of health food stores and things. They cap it and all that stuff. Uh, they do their own thing with it. I've worked with it a couple of times. And then you see just the way it takes off and picks on another tree. So this is a big uh, red lapuna. They say if you boil the bark to this this tea, you can jump to a new level of shamanic training after years of training. So it's another big one. And the lupunas are always considered um, strength. Okay. This one, the Kungo Palm, Supaikasha, Thorn of the Devil. This thing even looks like a badass. It has all these spikes. And they say that if you take that and you decide to go into black magic, there's no turning back. And I found it interesting. You just look at that thing and you're like, you don't want to get near it. All those spines are like, get away from me. And I realized, studying it for a little bit, nothing else grows around it. It's like even the other plants are like, get out of here, man, I'm you're on you. So it's a pretty bad one. Another little close up. This is Katawa, they use for poisonous uh, snake bite remedy. This one's one of the more popular, widely used one, Chuchuwasi. I've worked with it a bunch of times. Uh, sexual stimulant, anti-inflammatory, treatment for arthritis and rheumatism. Shamanate gives you a lot of energy, internal strength, and courage. It's a real fortifier. And um, a lot of the old guys down there, they drink it in a little shot. It's supposed to keep Mr. Johnson really happy. Um, it's, it's kind of a well-known joke about uh, why they carry tradition. Next. That's one of my favorite herb ladies. This is all tobacco. And this tobacco, by the way, uh, used in the mapachos and ceremony and other ways. Uh, as I mentioned, it's nicotino rustica. It has five to 
seven times the nicotine of the crap they sell up there. And um, when I was younger, I, when I finally quit smoking, I was smoking two and a half packs of Marlboros a day. And I stopped, and I was out for years and years and years. And then I, I took a few hits of that, and I inhaled it, and I got hooked on the head rush. And I started getting hooked again. I thought, whoa, I'm going to back off on that. And what I discovered through the uh, shamanic teachers that I had is that um, they say it's such a powerful ally that you have to respect it. And that whole addictive thing um, is sort of part of its power and that boundary you really should walk. So I only use it in ceremony now and I, and I don't inhale it anymore. I give it the respect that it deserves. Okay. Can't see this very well, but this is one of the plant manuals and it talks about the different plants and the qualities that they have and what you can do with it. Okay, next. That's it. There, that's that. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, all this work is shadow work, primarily, especially now with us Westerners going down there and working with it. And it brings up all of the stuff that's inside of you, whether you like it or not. It has a way of finding your deepest fears and kind of rubbing your face in it. Um, so, it's always an ordeal. Uh, growth Generally speaking, growth is never really fun. The results can be great um, as time passes, but um, you can't, it's, it's, it's not, I've had girlfriends, oh, I want to go to the jungle, and I start to tell them about what's happening, and they're like, oh, maybe I don't, you know, because it's just not a fun thing. But I, I wouldn't trade it for the world, I really learned a lot from it. It's changed my life in radical ways. Um, in the um, Archetypal world, it's considered to be the dark feminine. When you say it, are you talking about iron? Or the, yeah. I mean, of yeah. There, yeah. The specialized in the ceremonies. Yeah. Not the other teacher plants. No, they all have different things. Um, right. Ayahuasca is considered to be the mother of all the other plants. Okay, so you're speaking about iron. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the whole, you know, one of the things that fascinated me about ayahuasca and shamanism and DMT initially is the agreed upon psychological landscape. Crystal Castles, which I've, I've visited many times. Um, the fact that you can be in the jungle, and you can be in New York City, no matter where you are, you're still going to see snakes and jaguars, and you're going to have those particular animals that are associated with it. So I have this whole thing, I'm, right now, um, I'm writing a nonfiction book about perception and altered states and shamanism, <clears throat> and all those things. And um, when you get into that state, you're in an ayahuasca circle. You're all drinking. So the analogy I'd love to use is you're all tuning into the same radio station. If everybody here had a radio, we all had our own radios. We all tuned to the same station. Even though we have all these different radios, we'd all be hearing the same thing. So when you get into the ayahuasca state, you get into that vibe. And you can have sometimes uh, telepathic experiences. And you have, so it's an individual journey done in a group setting. So you have your individual journey, and then you have sort of the whole energy of the group to support you in that. And when the shaman is doing his job, um, he's, he's like riding her on the orchestra and keeping the energy and knowing that maybe an energy leaks over here or maybe this person's having a problem. Funny things happen, like one person will purge with the whole group and all these other really wonderfully strange things. It's also very, very unpredictable, which is one of the things I've always loved about it, because you never know. And it does have a cumulative effect. So um, some people have a great experience on it, and suddenly they're enlightened, and the whole world changes, and all these things. And then two weeks later, they're in their regular daily life, and they go slip right back into what they were doing before. They forget. So it, if you learn it, um, you need to learn to also walk the walk. Because otherwise you're kind of wasting your time. It's just not something you mess with. Yes? Exactly what I wanted to ask. Um, so if people do this to do the shadow work, is there um, support or the psychological you know, integration? integration? Yes. <laughs> good, good question. Good, very good question. Thank you. So in the prehistoric days, no, because they were all living together and they were really a cohesive unit. But in most, all the sessions that I've worked in, um, there's always an integration session. So, um, typically, 
we'll do it at night, and although I've done a few daytime sessions, but we'll do it at night, and then the session may end about three or four in the morning. Everybody goes to bed, gets a little bit of sleep if they can. Then we get up and we have a big potluck breakfast, and then we all meet. We go around the circle, and everybody integrates. And whoever's running the show is there to help interpret things or figure out uh, what's happening or help them to have a good understanding of what their experience was. And um, many, many, many times, somebody else's experience helps another person with something they were struggling with. Or, you know, one of the amazing things happened last time, among a lot of amazing things, which is why I've continued to work with it. The, uh, the guy I was with um, was singing a song about Palo Santo. Does anybody know what Palo Santo is? I know some of you guys do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> Palo Santo means holy wood. And it's a really sweet smelling, and you can burn it, and it's good. It's similar to sage. It's a cleanser and kind of kind of protect your thing. Uh, a little more on the gentler side as opposed to tobacco, which is really strong. Anyway, he's singing this song, the Palo Santo. Because when you sing the Icaros, you're singing to the plants, you're singing to the spirits of the forest, and you're honoring them, and you're flattering them, because the mother's feminine. So you're like, you know, hey, baby, you're beautiful, you know, and I'm singing this just for you, and Maybe you can help me out, you know, help a brother out. Um, but you, you sing, you honor them. So anyway, he was singing this song to the Palo Santo. And I started smelling it. And I wasn't smelling it burning. I was smelling it fresh. And like, nobody had any there. And I, right with the song, he was singing it. And, and, and he's singing, I'm sitting back and I'm going, wow, that really blew my mind. And then this girl from across the room said, is anybody else smelling Palo Santo while he was playing that song? And I was like, Whoa. So those are some of the things that can happen. The, the essence of shamanism, among other things, is that shamanism is all about energy. Absolutely everything is energy. So when you go into a circle and you drink, you're creating a particular energy within yourself. There's this whole thing about, um, in fact, the opening, I call the opening chapter of my memoir, A Waking Dream. Because we go through our lives with our left brains primarily active, more so, generally speaking, for males. Females are more in touch with their right side and their intuition and their hearts and their feminine. Guys are generally more, and we generally function in the world with our left brain, and the right brain kind of gets sh shut out, again, more so with, with males, generally speaking. It's like a lot of gay bros, and they can, like, sh they can run all of it. <laughs> but, um, so, generally speaking, your left brain is kind of running the show. When you go to sleep at night, your left brain gets a rest and your right brain comes out to play. And that's what dreaming is. Dreaming is a language of the right brain and it's not linear, rational, logical, boom. It's, um, it's visual, it's conceptual, it's emotional, it's a whole other kind of language. And that's why you can be in a dreaming state and be doing the weirdest things like flying over the buildings and you're accepting of it because you're in that mode of consciousness. So what happens you know, when you drink ayahuasca is that the right brain gets woken up but the left brain hasn't gone to sleep. And that's when the fun begins. And what I always tell people is when you're in those states that sometimes things happen so quickly, don't try to figure it out. Let it rip, ride the wave, dance. Because that's what integration is all about. And the people who I've always seen to the man who have had the biggest, biggest, biggest problems and the most traumatic problems are the heavy-duty intellectuals. People who are what they call intellectually centered. I have a good friend who's a PhD and he came down to the jungle. Wouldn't go unless I was there. Real, real brainiac. And he spent the first three sessions curled up in my lap. Just because he was used to solving everything with his rational brain. And I'm here to tell you, your rational brain don't work in this situation. So if you're sitting there and you're trying to figure it out, you're looking for trouble because it just doesn't work. So you really got to ride with it, and then there's time later to figure it out. And when you work with it over longer periods of time, you have different levels of integration. Like if I never drank any ever again, I'm still integrating from all the years that I did it. And I, something all of a sudden from what happened to me eight years ago, I was like, oh, yeah, that's what that was. Or something from 12 years ago ties in with something from six years before that, and then I get this other revelation, and those bigger levels of integration always go on. I like to 
to say I'm in a constant state of integration. And I always like to say I'm also permanently altered. I'm tripping all the time. I don't need anything else. When I take it now, it's because I help people or I facilitate and I, and I go on the journey with them. But I really don't have a, a, a need anymore for myself personally. Like uh, my buddy Lorenzo, who was going to introduce me when he got sick, uh, he always says, uh, and he quoted from somebody in terms of doing a lot of psych uh, psychedelics, um, he got the message, you can hang up the phone now. <laughs> you know? And I'm not um, easily impressed. But I, but I, I can honestly say that um, it's changed my life. It made a big difference for me. It's opened me up in ways I could never have imagined. Um, how are we doing for time? Um, We're ready for questions whenever Yeah, I want some Q&A. Yeah. You guys, I got a lot of experience. Pick my brain. Yes, sir. I was curious, if you come upon like an aha moment in a session, being a writer, do you actually transcribe, just change the names a little bit and put that experience onto somebody else? Is that how you use some of your aha moments in the session? No. Good question. From a creative standpoint, I'm a writer. I'm always writing. I mean, if I'm not writing, I'm editing somebody else's book or, you know, I'm, a, I'm an author, editor, teacher. So when I go to the jungle, I don't want to write. So um, I went my first year with a cassette. And the first year, well, I have this I have sort of a little ritual where I get back to my tombo after the session, take off all my clothes. I spend more of the time naked in the jungle anyway. I love it. Um, take my plant bath, and then I get on my recorder when it's still fresh in my mind. And I, vote, and I speak into the recorder and record my experience. So when I went the first time and I was being sort of Mr. Anthropologist and all this other stuff, I filled up like a dozen cassettes on both sides. You know, oh, I farted. Okay, you know, say that. Oh, the wind blew a leaf across my way. Oh, wow, maybe it's magic. You know, all this crazy stuff. And then like the next year, maybe I had eight tapes and the next year there were four and then two. And then after a while, I'm like, eh, I'm done. It's all going on up here. But, I'm glad I did that because um, the end of my memoir there ends with my first time in the jungle because I had a very profound experience then. And so I was writing it and I had it down pretty good, but then when I listened to myself in there on the tape, when you know, I had gone through it, it really enhanced things. So um, I do it that way. But I, I, don't, when I don't, when I go down there, I, don't, I just want to uh, submit myself to the experience and let it take me. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Question about you said the five doses in ten days. Uh, I heard before that the, the, the hallucinogens at normal doses uh, don't work one, more than once a week. Or if you're taking a dose, you have to double the dose in order to yeah to feel an effect. But I mean, if you're taking a you know a, let's say a strong medium strong dose, you know you can't take it the next day. Your brain just doesn't function. That's true with LSD. But not with ayahuasca, and not with other things. LSD has a very uh, built-in tolerance. Like you can take a good dose. If you take the same dose, the very same dose the next day, you probably won't feel anything. You're correct. It's like exponential. The more you do it, the more it's going to take. Well, this was for psilocybin. This was in a mushroom class that I took at the university. Uh, so I mean, you know, this is coming from uh, you know, a professor who studied it and say psilocybin's possible because I never did it. Yeah, but I, psilocybin, I'm here to tell you. psilocybin does have that similar tolerance, but yeah. they actually have done tolerance studies with DMT specifically, and there doesn't seem to be any okay. any buildup of tolerance. I know I think Rick Strassman did that research in the yes. 90s. So that's probably why ayahuasca doesn't seem to yeah, increase it, tolerance. Yeah, it doesn't. I've taken dose after dose. I even at one point I went up for like a fourth dose, and they both, Roni and Ken there, both at the same time went, no. Sometimes I've taken like two and three doses and not much happened. And then other times I just take this little dose and I get my brains totally blown out. You don't know. You don't know. Everybody's physiologically different. Everybody's neurochemically different. Um, then when you're doing the dieta down there, and, and even with a particular plan, 
plants, like I've worked with some of the other plants that were also visionary, which were some of the better experiences. Another interesting thing in that